In part three of our Max for Live best practices series, we're going to take a look at some advanced areas of Max for Live development that we feel are really important for both developers and users. These are areas you will want to seriously consider when making your device, but even more importantly when releasing or selling your device to the world. Following these recommendations will ensure a high level of usability for your device within the Ableton Live community. It's also a way to demonstrate your own professionalism and attention to detail as a developer in the wider DSP music community. Sometimes, when developing your own Max for Live device, you may find that you want to incorporate Max objects that are not part of the default Max distribution. Reasons for doing this might include giving your device extended functionalities that are not possible with vanilla Max, or wanting to develop your own object for a very specific purpose. Examples of this might be as simple as including objects taken from third-party packages found inside the Max Package Manager. Objects developed by other developers that are freely available across the web, or an object that you've coded up yourself using the Cycling74 Max SDK or Min SDK. Either way, including these objects in your device correctly is vital to ensure its intended functionality and a positive user experience. First, there are two file types. These types ensure that your device will work on both Mac and Windows platforms within Ableton Live. The Mac file type is the object name .mxo and the Windows file type is object name .mxe. To verify that your objects are included with your Max for Live device, click on the Show Containing Project icon in the Edit view of your Max for Live device. Once this opens, depending on if you've already saved your device or not, the third-party objects contained will show up under the Patches tab. However, this does not mean that they are included by default. If you think you're using third-party objects and they're not showing up, at the bottom of the project window you can click on the fourth icon from the left, Manage Project, and then select Consolidate. Now any third-party objects associated with your device will show up. To ensure that they are included, we need to right-click on the objects and select Include in Project. When we save and freeze our device, those objects will be included, making your device compatible across both operating systems. There are a lot of Max patches out there across the internet and most people don't mind sharing their Max code for the broader community to use as they like. But there is some etiquette and good practices, and more importantly, ethical and legal aspects to using other people's code that you should keep in mind. If parts of your patch use Max code and patching directly out of the Max help files or examples of online content Cycling74 has created, there is no need to recognize this in your patches. Go for it, the world is your oyster. If you've used Max code taken directly from a developer's personal website, a Max patch or Max for Live device, where there's no mention of a license or request for attribution, it is still good etiquette to reference where the code came from with a thank you or a link inside a comment object. It might even be helpful for people who want to explore that particular code directly from the source and pays an important tip of the hat acknowledgement to someone who's helped you on your Max journey. The most important thing to be aware of surrounding licensing is using code from Max patches or Max Vali devices that explicitly have licenses associated with them. The most common license in use is the Creative Commons license. These licenses vary 
from being able to freely use the max code providing you attribute the source to more restrictive licensing that doesn't allow any changing of the max code you're using or restricts your ability to share the code or use it in a commercial product. It's of the utmost importance that this licensing is respected as this helps the community prosper and grow. It makes you a good participant within the community but also means you stay clear of any possible legal implications. If in doubt, it's best to ask. It's been 10 years now since Max for Live was first released. From almost the start, people were selling Max for Live devices commercially. Everything ranging from very basic utilities to advanced synthesizers and beyond. As a developer of commercial Max for Live devices, it's really important to understand what it is you're doing by selling your device to a user. What does it mean in terms of the way you present yourself when a customer, big or small, spends money to buy your product? What are their expectations for your Max for Live device? And what are your responsibilities as a developer? Cycling74 and Ableton provide support for Max and Max for Live. That support, for the most part, covers core functionality, provides assurance that Max is working correctly, that objects are compiled properly and distributed correctly. It's not possible for us to provide support for Max code at the patching level, unless this points out a lower level issue with Max itself. A great example of a successful Max for Live developer operating independently of Ableton and Cycling74 would be K-Devices. K-Devices do a great job of all of the aspects that we expect of someone selling commercial content developed in Max for Live using Max. They release professional devices with UIs that include hints and their patches are extensively commented. They present their content for sale in a professional manner and provide an easy to navigate purchase process. They provide user accounts that give their customers a way to access and download their devices at a later date should they lose them. More importantly, when they release a Max of Live device, they support it by creating content that lets users learn how to operate their new devices. They provide manuals and other assistance, as well as posts to social media. Most importantly, they provide a support channel via email to help customers with their pressing issues surrounding the device that they've just purchased. We understand that not everyone wants to commercialize their devices at the level of K-Devices and that there are several alternatives for distributing commercial Max for Live devices, including Gumroad, Patreon, and even Bandcamp. Even when you're using these services, it's still possible to support your release with tutorial content, help files, and a support channel email address for any issues that customers might have with their new purchase. Good customer support is one of the most effective marketing strategies you can commit to. If you make a device and sell it and support it, people will be more likely to want to purchase the next thing that you make and sell. It's confidence inspiring. We touched on the subject of style in both part one and part two of this video series and would recommend checking them out if you haven't already. Let's start by considering layout. The simplest thing to know about the layout is setting the device width manually. This can be done when in edit mode in your Max for Live device by navigating to the menu bar and clicking view set device width. This is great for smaller devices where you don't need to alter the size of the UI. But let's take a closer look at two advanced methods of changing UI size. In part two of this series, we looked at the Convolution Reverb Pro. 
It has a subsection of controls that include EQ, position, modulation, dampening, and the shape. The UI of these controls is included in the patcher that is loaded inside this B patcher here. If you double click on this P view sub patcher, you'll see that it contains a number of message objects that say script, send box, tab display, offset, dollar sign one, zero. You'll notice that the control tab for the different effects running into this sub patcher is multiplied by 275 or minus 274. And then that number is filled in as the variable in our message. This message is then sent out from the sub patcher to a this patcher object. The this patcher object is telling the B patcher to basically move left or move right by 274 pixels, depending on which model you have selected. This is a really great way to allow for easy navigation of a lot of controls in a small amount of space. The other example that we looked at in part two was the surround panner. This method is really useful in situations where you have some more advanced parameters that you want to reveal only after the user is familiar with the initial controls. This method uses a simple bit of patching. If we open surround panner into edit mode, we can see that the toggle here is selecting between on off and outputting a one and a zero, which is triggering two different numbers depending on the selection. That number is then connected to a set width dollar sign one message, which outputs a variable number into the live dot this device object to change the width dynamically. I'm a big fan of this simple lightweight solution. One approach to styling your Max Light device is to make sure that your device's UI fits in well with Live's native devices. It's easy to find an example of a Max for Live device that harmonizes with Live's default native devices. Here's the LFO in Live's device view, placed just after the wavetable synth. You'll see that the LFO looks right at home when compared to the wavetable synth. But dropping in this LFO that I modified back in Live 8, uh, kind of doesn't look so good. Let's take a look at this new object that was introduced with Live 10. It's called Live.Colors. You saw it briefly in part two of this series. Drag in a new blank Max for Live audio effect and open it in edit mode. Make a new object by pressing the N on the keyboard and type live.colors. I want to show you a quick example of how you can use this in your device to ensure compatibility with live color themes. This is an important aspect of Max programming to consider and ensures a more professional looking device. If you're unsure of the message to use with the live.colors object, you can consult the help file. Let's make two objects. Let's make a live.text and a live.dial. For this example, there's no need to change anything else. I want to ensure that the text color changes for both of these objects, depending on the color theme. To do that, we're going to send a message into live.colors each time that the color theme changes. The message that we send into live.colors is control underscore FG. You might be wondering how we bang this message when a theme is changed. The live.color object has a second outlet that sends a bang each time the theme changes. If we take that bang and route it back to the message by drawing a patch cord, our message will check in with the live.colors object to find out the current foreground color each time the live color theme changes. 
The live.color object will send out a message containing an RGBA value that looks like this. Control underscore FG 0.0.0.1. We can then use this message and run it into our route control underscore FG object and send the output of that into a message box containing text color dollar sign one dollar sign two dollar sign three dollar sign four message. We then connect that to all of the live dot objects whose color we would like to be visible regardless of live's color theme. This way our objects will dynamically update to always make the text of our live dot objects visible. This can be implemented for almost every color aspect of all of the live dot objects in Max for Live. It's worth pointing out that you may however like to style your UIs differently than Live's look and feel, but it's still important to test these across all themes for usability. Of course you might like to take a completely different approach to UI development, perhaps a more conceptual approach. A set of Max for Live devices with a more conceptual approach are from renowned artist Jace Clayton. He made a set of Max for Live devices called the Sufi plugins. Jace Clayton's devices were developed with the intention of getting away from regimented synthesizer standards intended to spark discussion and creation overlapping between software design, musical tools, encoded spirituality, digital art, and indigenous knowledge systems. Sufi plugins on release were quite popular and have been downloaded more than 20,000 times, showing that a typical UI approach is not always required, but it's still vital that your interface is well thought out with the user in mind. Ableton's push controller didn't exist when Max for Live was first released. Since its release, it's become an important tool for many live users. The introduction of Push 2 in 2015 also significantly increased that importance. As a Max for Live developer, it's highly likely your user will be using your Max for Live device with an Ableton push. And it's worth considering this as you develop it. If you've followed part one and part two of this video series, you're already a long way there. An important aspect covered in naming live.objects correctly is that names will appear in live's automation lanes, but also the short names will be displayed when using Ableton Push when we expose them using the live.banks object. This object is easy to use and relatively straightforward to configure. Open your device in edit mode and make sure you've named all of the live.objects correctly. See part 1 and part 2 in this video series if you're unsure what to do. With the patch locked, double click on the live.banks object and a window opens. By default, it will have bank 1 with eight configurable columns. Under each column there is a drop down menu and providing you have named your objects correctly, their short names should all be displayed here. Go ahead and designate where you would like each parameter to appear on Push's display, left to right, in the columns one to eight. At the bottom you can hit the plus symbol to add another bank. Use as many banks as you like to expose important parameters for your device. Using live.banks ensures an immediate integration with Ableton Push and a more user-friendly experience of your device. This concludes our Max for Live programming guidelines series. We hope this has been helpful for you. Happy patching!